introduction, uh, I will begin with three brief prefatory remarks. Uh, the first concerns the alleged wit and wisdom of Mario Draghi. Uh, I would invite you to compare the anecdote offered by Professor Kerman with the following passage. Uh, quote, it is told that such are the aerodynamics and wing loading of the bumblebee that in principle it cannot fly. It does, and the knowledge that it defies the august authority of Isaac Newton and Orville Wright must keep the bee in constant fear of a crack-up. One can assume, in addition, that it is apprehensive of the matriarchy to which it is subject, for this is known to be an oppressive form of government. The bumblebee is a successful but an insecure insect. That passage appears on page one of a major bestseller in its day, entitled American Capitalism, the Concept of Countervailing Power, by a certain John Kenneth Galbraith, published in 1952. And if Monsieur Draghi uh, cited his source, I salute him. If not, he is a plagiarist and a fool. <laughs> Secondly, on the question of facts, which we've been enjoined uh, to respect, I do want to cite just quickly on the question of the Greek debt that came up earlier. The facts that I have are that between 2010 and 2015, the start of 2015, 252 billion euro were dispersed. Of these, 149 billion were to pay interest and principal, 48.2 to bail out the Greek banks, 34.5 as a quote sweeteners for the private sector to get them to accept the restructuring in 2012. The total of that is 231.7, leaving less than 10% uh, as support actually for the Greek economy. That's the basis of the argument that 90% uh, went to the creditors. Uh, you can argue over the status of some of those items, but those are the basic facts, and the source is the UK Jubilee Debt uh, Report that was issued on the 26th of January, 2015. Okay, thirdly, I am going to adapt the maxim of Marshall uh, from mathematics to PowerPoint. I have done mine carefully and I have thrown it away. Uh, I am going, however, to begin with a text uh, that I took uh, yesterday from Mariana Mazzucato, uh, who took it from Albert Hirschman, who wrote that the hallmark of a paradigm shift is the acceptance of new categories and the abandonment of old ones, the precise wording, the success of a theory consists in that suddenly everyone begins to reason according to new categories. In the fairly new and I think still ad hoc field of inequality studies, this shift has mostly not occurred. Uh, economists think instinctively along national lines, uh, because uh, that is where uh, the, uh, the data are mostly organized that way. And they think in terms of supply and demand in national labor markets, because their minds are mostly organized that way. And the result of this pair of uh, categorical uh, conceits or presumptions uh, is a number of standard and fallacious ideas. Uh, at the methodological level, uh, this leads to the proposition that the changes and mostly increases in inequality are driven by technology on the demand side, famously skilled by a technical change, and by education and sometimes by trade on the supply side. Uh, further, it leads to the argument, uh, empirical presumption, that pay structures are more unequal in the United States than in what is called Europe, uh, and that the historically lower unemployment in the US is due to its, quote, labor market flexibility as against the rigidity, uh, allegedly, of European pay structures. This then leads to the presumption uh, that unemployment in Europe can be resolved by restructuring labor markets, national labor markets, one by one, along what are allegedly American lines. 
That is to say, through privatization, deregulation, uh, the elimination of collective bargaining, and the other nostrums of the neoliberal policy agenda. Reality has been quite harsh on those who have accepted, implemented, and especially on those who have been subjected to this line of thought. And the reason, I would argue, is that the categories involved are hopelessly inadequate to the actual problems uh, that we face. In the first place, economic inequality is not a phenomenon primarily of semi-separated national labor markets. It is, first of all, a phenomenon of capital income as well as labor income. And so if you're looking at the inequality of household incomes, and in particular in wealthy countries where there are uh, reasonably accurate records, of which the United States is an important example, uh, profit-based incomes tend to drive household income inequality measures, which is why the rise and sometimes the fall of them closely corresponds to the movements of asset prices, in particular the stock market, with peaks in 2000, 2007, uh, and after 2010, 2011, uh, and 2013. It is a phenomenon also, that is to say the movement of inequality, which I have shown through a project which has been engaged in attempting to measure things systematically and on an empirically consistent basis, a uh, project that's gone on for over uh, 20 years now, uh, it is a phenomenon that moves across the world in great macroeconomic waves. That is to say, waves of boom and bust, the rise and fall of commodity prices and of interest rates, debt deflation, and above all, changing global financial regimes. That is to say, important change, uh, destabilization after the uh, end of Bretton Woods in 1971, and a vast increase uh, in inequality that went around the world from 1980 to 2000, touching first the countries affected by the global debt crisis in the early 80s, then Eastern Europe uh, and the former Soviet Union in the late 1980s and 1990s, and on to Asia in the late 1990s, with a peak, by and large, in 2000, following which, after the years of untrammeled global liberalization uh, came to at least a provisional end, following which there was a substantial leveling off uh, and some declines, especially in Latin America, parts of Africa, uh, in Russia, and even actually in China, although the dynamics there, we believe, are substantially different, uh, which shows that there is a global uh, common force behind these movements of inequality to a very substantial extent, but also that it is not something which is as inexorable as some authors, Thomas Piketty in particular, have led one to believe, but rather a, uh, something which has been uh, an artifact to a substantial extent of the policy regimes imposed on the global economy uh, during particular periods. And yet, despite this kind of analysis having taken hold not only in my work, but also in others, including Piketty's, uh, there is, so far as I know, as yet still no category uh, in the Journal of Economic <coughs> Literature for macroeconomic analysis of inequality. So as a functional matter, one could not classify this as economic research, since inequality is treated as a, a, uh, uh, as a uh, taxonomic category to be dealt with under the microeconomics of labor markets. That is an example of how the strength of categories bears on the professional economic mind. Let me turn now to the second set of category errors, which are those affecting Europe. These are geographic and statistical. Uh, they occur, they arise by examining European countries one by one, which is how habitually, of course, economic data are collected, uh, and by comparing these countries pairwise to the United States, which leads to the view, uh, not inaccurately, that the United States is more unequal than practically every European country, slightly more so than Italy and Spain, but certainly much more so uh, than Germany, Denmark, Sweden, or Finland. But you cannot reasonably compare Denmark, a country of, last I looked, 5.9 million cheese-eating former social democrats on a cold <laughs> northern water, uh, to the United States actually have such a place in the United States, 5.9 million cheese-eating former social democrats by a cold northern water. It's called Wisconsin. 
exists. It's right there. And it, too, is far more egalitarian than the United States. So this kind of comparison is intrinsically, uh, statistically uh, problematic. What has been the case, of course, true for decades in Europe, is that there exists here an open, integrated continental economy for all practical investment purposes, certainly for purposes of mobile mobility of uh, corporations and capital. Therefore, it follows that the vast inequalities, the very substantial inequalities, which exist across European national boundaries, the internal boundaries inside this integrated continental economy, the, the differences that exist between Belgium and Bulgaria, between Finland and Greece, have to be factored in. And the question is how you do that. The method for doing so uh, is available. It, it requires a change in the computational techniques for calculating measures of inequality, uh, but these can be made perfectly consistent with uh, standard measures. You just have to use the uh, generalized entropy approach to uh, inequality measurements, specifically tile statistics. I won't go into the details of that. But once you have realized that you have to factor uh, uh, these um, in, uh, between country inequalities into the picture, then according to calculations that we actually made from OECD data some 15 years ago, these add about 30% uh, to the total of European pay inequalities, industrial pay inequalities, compared to the United States. And since it's pay inequalities which are the relevant uh, uh, frame for comparing uh, 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 labor market outcomes, this actually reverses the standard conclusion that there is lower pay inequality in Europe uh, than in the United States. And since it does that, it invalidates the major pillar of the so-called flexible market approach to unemployment. It's simply not the case that low American unemployment has been due uh, to a more flexible structure of pay. Uh, it is, uh, you have to attribute it instead to a more flexible macroeconomic policy and perhaps to a large nonprofit sector uh, which provides, absorbs labor in occupations like healthcare and education, where the U.S. share is about twice uh, GDP as a share of GDP as it is in most countries in Europe. Perhaps not the most efficient way to proceed, but certainly something that has the effect of providing a lot of jobs. Which raises a question. Is there a better theory? Can we think analytically in a more sensible way about the relationship between unemployment and inequality? Uh, and actually, economists have not been entirely uh, 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 deficient on this. They have provided ways of thinking about this. And I'll give you two examples that I have been uh, very drawn to over the years, because I think they have a great deal of relevance. In 1971, Harris and Todaro, studying East Africa, actually, pointed out that inequalities between the cities and the countryside foster migration and job search with unemployment that results from the fact that in high inequality societies, and of course any developing country with a city and a countryside is going to have a high degree of inequality just across those two sectors, there are always by definition more prize seekers than there are prizes. Anyone observing Spain in the period after Franco, China with its vast migrations from the countryside to the cities and from the interior to the coast, or for that matter, Silicon Valley in California, can see the universal applicability of this idea. People are drawn to where the money is, and typically more people go uh, than jobs are available if the society is highly unequal and if the differentials are very large. This is also why, uh, in the present state of the world, migration cannot be stopped. It is a function of the inequalities that are there, notwithstanding every canoe wedding uh, is uh, ties. So that's one proposition. Inequality and search, migration, and unemployment are closely linked. You should expect a positive, not a negative, correlation between these two phenomena. Uh, secondly, uh, much earlier, in 1951, Wren and Meidner of the LO, uh, the Swedish Trade Union in Stockholm, articulated 
There is therefore a discipline on capital that results from having a regulation on the wage structure, which uh, uh, creates a process of growth uh, and produces productivity growth and wealth, which can then be used to keep the whole population employed. Uh, this principle is essentially a large part, in my view, of what drove Scandinavia over decades uh, from, from the middle of the European distribution to the top of the world income distribution, and at the same time, the bottom of the world unemployment mean table, that is to say, to be uh, amongst the most successful uh, economic examples of economic development in modern history. So because of these two principles, the reality of Europe, and for that matter, of the world, and you can demonstrate this statistically, and we have done so, is that countries and regions with more egalitarian pay structures, which is to say less flexible labor markets, systematically have enjoyed less unemployment uh, than those uh, that uh, uh, with higher and more, uh, with, with higher, more unequal uh, economic structures. Uh, this is an effect which is mitigated only in some small countries. We can think, for example, of the case of Portugal, uh, mainly by immigration. That is to say, if you have a great deal of inequality uh, and the possibility for the large share of the population to leave the country, then they don't show up in the national unemployment statistics. And that is a mitigation, if you like, but it is not one which consists of, which, which constitutes an attractive development model. What conclusion should one draw from this? Uh, I think the conclusion is reasonably straightforward, uh, which is that the reforms agenda, the crucial uh, link, I should say, the fulcrum of the neoliberal policy platform, which has, amongst other things, been imposed uh, relentlessly on Greece, uh, is analytically invalid because it moves in the wrong direction toward greater rather than lesser inequalities and is actually <coughs> and actively dangerous. This will come as no surprise uh, to the Greeks, who have suffered from six years so far of this policy and now enjoy a whopping uh, unemployment rate on the cusp of 30 uh, percent, uh, with about twice that uh, for young workers who essentially have no alternative except immigration. But for Europe, there's also a larger lesson. Uh, since so much inequality exists across national lines, it is that this problem must be addressed in a transnational way with sweeping measures that will build for decades toward a gradual uh, reduction of the inter-regional inequalities. And interestingly, by the way, if you compare Europe to the United States, uh, what, whereas 70 years ago at the start of the New Deal, the U.S. was also ridden by vast inter-regional inequalities, North and South, the old Confederacy versus the rest of the country, those have been mitigated very, very substantially by the range of public spending and, and transfer programs that have raised the income of the southern region nearly to the level of everybody else. Although inequalities, uh, the vast inequalities that exist tend to be much more local in character in the United States. That's not the case in the European context. That problem needs to be addressed with the policies that are suited to the European scene. Yanis Varoufakis, Stuart Holland, and I uh, attempted to lay out an agenda for this several years ago, dealing with debt, that is to say, using the European Central Bank to help mutualize uh, the Maastricht compliant components of uh, the, uh, uh, the national debts, case-by-case uh, -case resolution of the of insolvent banks, breaking the link between toxic banks and to bankrupt banks and bankrupt governments, an investment and jobs agenda through the European investment bank and other institutions that are competent for that purpose, and finally a solidarity agenda uh, that could begin with nutrition assistance that go on to unemployment insurance and the European Pension Union and other measures that would stabilize the incomes of households in the more vulnerable regions that would all tend to work toward reducing interregional inequalities, which are certainly going to continue to be stabilized by preserving in place of viable countries and societies or they will become overwhelming problems everywhere and quite soon. Uh, and I just have uh, a word to say about uh, specifically 
should be abhorrent and detestable. Abhorrent and detestable, even if it were possible, even if it enriched ourselves, even if it did not sow the decay of the whole civilized life of Europe. I'm sure it's possible to do better, and I hope that some uh, analytical support